as I was saying, before I was so rudely interrupted by a bad communication problem, I was watching my mom, she was getting kids to send pictures in, um, just odd pictures that they just drew, things that they wanted to, horses, dragons, all sorts of things. There were some kids that sent in pictures of Legos. So what I was thinking was, there is something that I do when I'm with school groups sometimes, and that is I have kids draw something or write something on a piece of paper, and we put all of those things into a hat, and then we create a couple of names, and we create a, um, a location, a setting, and then I start telling a story based on those two characters. No superhero characters, no TV characters, no book characters. We got to make these characters up all by ourselves and use our imagination, okay? And um, then I have lots of hats. So I'll put all of these things in that you're going to send to me. I'm going to put all of those into a hat and I'm going to pull them out one by one. It could be a drawing, it could be a word, it could be anything. And I'll make up a story next week, next Wednesday at three o'clock. And hopefully I'll have this technical thing ironed out and we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Um, so thank you, Mara, for letting me borrow that idea of yours because I think it's an awesome idea. And I'm going to tell you a story now, which comes from Japan. And some of you might know this. There's next door neighbor's dog yapping in the background. Um, this story takes place in Japan, Japanese story, and it's about New Year's Eve. Now, in Japan, they celebrate New Year's Eve in very much the same way that we might celebrate Christmas or Thanksgiving. It's a great feast where every family member comes to share. At least that's what I believe. And if I'm wrong, please let me know. I'd love to be corrected on this if I'm wrong. And it's a big event for Japanese people. They love New Year's Eve. You know, while we go out party, they have the whole family around. And then probably go out partying. And this story is about two brothers. And these two brothers, well, one of them was rich, the older one, and the younger one was poor. Now, the reason the younger one was poor was not because he didn't have a job or anything. He did. But he saw when other people needed more than he needed. And so he would help these people out. He would either find them work or give them money or give them food. He would do all sorts of things for those around him in need. And therefore, he never had that much money. And sometimes he didn't have any money at all because he was always helping these people. Now, the older brother, he wasn't like that at all. He was the complete opposite. Heart of cold, he might say. Never gave anybody anything. Never gave people the time of day. What time is it? Mm. Don't care. Didn't react at all. Well, it was coming up to New Year's Eve. And the younger brother's wife said, said to her husband, she said, darling, I want all my family to come f for New Year's Eve. And we don't have enough rice. We don't have enough fish. We don't have enough anything. Do you have any money stashed away somewhere? N no, no, I don't. Well, could you go and ask your brother? If you could borrow some, or if we could take some rice or some fish from him and then pay him back. Well, he, he never lets anyone get anything. He doesn't help at all. He, he's not hes not that man. Well, I know he's not, but you could ask at least. I suppose I could. And so the younger brother got into a rowboat and he started to row out to the island off the coast where his brother lived. Because his brother, like I said, he was stinking rich. He had his own little island. He had this beautiful palace up there on the island and he rowed out to the island with his boat that he borrowed and when he got to the island the boat pulled up to the shore and he climbed out and tied it up to a rock and then made his made his way up to the palace where his brother lived one of the servants took him to the pond where all the koi fish were swimming because the older brother was feeding the fish in the in the pond and they greeted one another and they had a conversation and then the younger brother said brother i, I need your help um, my, we haven't got enough money to buy food and we don't have enough food to provide a meal for her family well you should have thought of that before you gave all your money away but brother I've got work I can pay you back no problem I can pay you back in a week or two easily no the older brother would not give in the younger brother tried his hardest to get his brother to give him just a little, just enough that they would have for their family. But the older brother was adamant, no. And so the younger brother left, said his goodbyes, 
made his way to the boat, rowed back to the mainland, gave the boat back to the person he borrowed it from and made his way home. As he was making his way home, an old man, bent over with age, was walking along. And on his back were this, this great bundle of sticks all tied together. And he had these bundles of sticks over his back. And he saw the young brother walking along. Young man, it looks like you have the whole weight of the world upon your shoulders. And yet I feel that I'm standing straighter than you with this bundle of sticks and my age upon my shoulders. Why don't you share your burden with me and carry mine? Okay, said the younger brother. And so he took that pile of sticks off the old man and put them on his own shoulders and held on to the rope and told the old man what had happened. How he'd been to see his brother and his brother hadn't given him anything and how he wanted to have some rice and some money to help out so that his wife's family could see him, visit him, and visit his wife and be with his wife and celebrate as a family. Well, my, my, my house is almost here. It's just there. Um, I, I'll take those sticks back now. And he took the sticks back from the young man and put them on his own shoulders. You know, I can help you, actually. You you can? How's that? Well, you know the great statue of Buddha? Now, some of you may not know what Buddha is or what Buddha looks like. And this is a teeny, teeny, tiny statue of Buddha. And he is a deity. And this statue that the old man was talking about, it wasn't this size. It wasn't a teeny, tiny little statuette like this. This statue was huge. It was 30 feet tall. And, and there, was, there was this fence, this wall of rhododendron bushes and other trees and plants. And the old man said, if you go into the, where the statue of Buddha is, you will find lots of little tiny people. Don't tread on them because they get very angry if you tread on them. Now, when you go in them, give... Here. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out this, this wrapper. And when he opened up the wrapper inside, there was a rice cake. And on the rice cake, there was honey. And it smelled delicious. The, the young man, the young brother, he could smell it. Now, these creatures are always hungry. So what you want to do is take this rice cake out and pretend that you're going to eat it. And when you do, they'll, they'll all come out asking, Oh, give me some, give me some, give me some. But, but they'll offer you all sorts of riches and things. But, but don't give in until, you, until they offer you a pestle and mortar. Now, you might not know what a pestle and mortar is either. It's one of these things. Pestle and mortar. Pestle, mortar. Now, doctors use these. They grind medicines of all sorts. Now, you could use one of these things too. You can grind herbs and spices, or as some people over in the US call them, herbs and spices. You can grind those up, and the aroma of these things mm, smells so good. But this pestle and mortar, young man, is a magic one. So make sure they give you the instructions before you leave. Now, thank you for carrying my wood. I hope my words have helped you. And the old man went off to his home, and the the younger brother thought, wow, this is great. And so he, he went through those walls of rhododendron, through those walls of bushes and plants. And there was that great statue of Buddha. And then he remembered to look down by his feet. And there were all these little tiny spirits, little tiny creatures, about this big, running around, <laughs> running around like mad. And the, the young brother looked at these creatures and he reached into his pocket where he put that rice cake and took it out and unwrapped it. And those little creatures, they must have heard him because all of a sudden they all start Arp! and they looked up. <laughs> what have you got there? Well, I, I, I've got this rice cake and it's got some honey on it and it's, oh, it smells so We can smell it, we can smell it. It does smell good. Don't eat it, don't eat it. Why can't I eat it? I'm hungry. I want to eat it. But no, 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 because we're really hungry. All of us, we're, aren't we hungry? Oh, yes, we're very hungry. Very hungry. We're all so hungry. We're so hungry. It feels like a stomach so turning inside out. It's so hungry. Please, can we have it? Well, um, but I'm very hungry too. Uh, I, I, but I want to eat it. Well, hang on a second. Hang, wait, 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 wait. And they gathered all around together in a big huddle. Well, what are you doing? We're hungry. Maybe we'll give him some silk. Oh, let's give him some silk. Yeah, silk, silk, silk. We got some silk. Would you like some silk? We have yards and yards and yards. Meters and meters and meters of silk. Would you like some silk? 
Well, silk would be nice, but I, I don't need it. I mean, he was thinking that he could use it. I mean, silk was expensive. He could sell that silk and buy food. But the old man had said, wait for the pestle and water. No, no, no I, I, I don't need silk. Thank you so much, though. You know, I said, wait, 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 wait. And they all got into a huddle again. Oh, go, go, yes, go, go. Go, we got some gold. We can give you lots of gold pieces if you want. Would you like some gold? Well, no, no I don't need gold pieces. Oh, my gosh, I really do. But I don't need gold pieces. Uh, I really need my snack right now. I'm so hungry. No! We've got a wooden pestle and mortar. Would you take that? Maybe. Is it magical? Maybe. Yes. Then it's a deal. And so one of the little creatures ran off and came back with a wooden pestle and mortar. Give us the rice cake. Give me the pestle and mortar. And so they exchanged the two. But before the man let go of the rice cake, he said, how does it work? Oh, uh, that's easy. What you need to do is you turn it clockwise and you wish for whatever you want to wish. And the pestle will fill up and fill up and fill up and you keep turning it. And, and then when you had enough, you turn it counterclockwise, you turn it anti-clockwise and then say thank you and it'll stop making whatever you were asking for. And then they exchanged. And the man went home. And the little creatures dived on that rice cake and tore it to shreds and got very sticky and filled their tiny little tummies with it. Well, the young brother's wife, when she saw him, asked him how it had gone with his older brother. And he said, well, no, my brother didn't give me anything. He said I should look after my finances better and plan for these things. But he wouldn't give me any rice, he wouldn't give me any money, no fish, nothing. But I got a wooden pestle and mortar. Wooden pestle and mortar? We don't need a wooden pestle and mortar, said his wife. We need food. We need money. Well, this old man, he told me, and he told his wife about it. Let's try it out, he said. We need rice, right? Yeah, we need rice. All right, so can we have some rice, please? It was amazing. Rice started to come out of the pestle and mortar, and it they got a sack, and they filled one sack, and they got a second sack, and they filled the second sack. Well, so thank you so much. He turned it counterclockwise, anti-clockwise. Thank you so much. Shook out the last bits into the sack. Well, may maybe we should ask for some fish. We can try. Can we have some fish? Oh, there's one. Oh, there's another. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, that little tiny fish. Oh. They asked for rice, they asked for fish, they even asked for some sake and put that in a couple of jugs. And they looked at this abundance of food that they got. They looked at each other. We could feed the poorer people of the village. We could have everybody here. And we could share this, this wondrous feast that we could make. But our house isn't big enough. What do you think? Could we have a bigger house, please? And the walls started to move out. Luckily, the roof moved out as well, because if it hadn't, then that would have crashed down on everybody, and that would have been the end of the story. But it didn't. It grew with the house. It grew wider, and it grew longer, until it was just about to encroach on the neighbor's property. And they said, no, no, thank you very much. We, we, we have enough now. Thank you, thank you. And it stopped growing. And they asked for some new tapestries to hang up, some new paintings for the walls. They asked for new beds for guests and sheets. And then they sent the invitations out to the whole village. And those that needed food and shelter, they came. They even sent an invitation to the older brother, who also came. Because he wanted to know how come his brother had shown up just a few days earlier with almost nothing, begging for help, begging for food. And then he's got, your house looks remarkably the same, but also somewhat different. You came to me a few days ago and asked if you could have money or food, and, and now you're giving this great feast. Where did you find your wealth? Well, I came upon a bit of luck. But that was all the younger brother said. A bit of luck. So the older brother stuck next to the younger brother to find out where he got this wealth from. Where did all this money come from that he could make his house look different and yet the same and get all this food that he was looking for for himself earlier? 
at the end of the evening, as people started to get up to go, there's a tradition that they have in, in Japan where coins are given to the children as they leave. And so the young brother said, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I want to give all the children coins before you go. And he went into the, the room where they were cooking. He pulled the screen almost shut, but the older brother was peeping through the crack in the screen. And he saw the younger brother turning the stick clockwise, asking for enough gold coins for each child that was there. And the gold coins, they flew out. And when he had enough coins, he reversed the mortar and said, thank you, and shook the last coin out. But the older brother did not see this. He only saw the turning. He had left after that and gone to get some food, for he was hungry. He hadn't eaten much because he'd been standing next to his younger brother, trying to find out where this treasure had come from. Do you mind if I spend the night here, younger brother? For I'm tired and it's a long way to, to sail back to my island. And it would be nice to spend the night with you and your wife. That wasn't what he was thinking. He wanted to steal the pestle and mortar. But his younger brother got out one of the new sleeping mats, got out new sheets for his brother. You have the, the place of honor in my home, he said. But the older brother didn't go to sleep. He listened and waited until he could hear the sounds of his brother and his sister-in-law fast asleep, snoring. And then he got up and took the pestle and mortar. And he saw a rice cake there on the counter, and he picked the rice cake, put it in his pocket, and made his way down to the boat. And he set the pestle and mortar down next to him and started to sail out back towards his island. But he was hungry, and so he reached into his pocket and pulled out the rice cake and took a bite. That's disgusting. It needs salt. I haven't got any salt. Ah, but I can use the pestle and mortar. And so he set the one thing down and picked up the other and started to turn and said, I would like some salt, please. And of course, it started to fill with salt. And so he took a pinch of salt and sprinkled it on to the rice cake, set the pestle and mortar down without turning it counterclockwise, without saying thank you, and continued sailing, eating that rice cake. But the boat became more sluggish in the water, and it seemed to be listing a lot more than it normally did. And he turned to look around to find out what was going on, and by the light of the moon he could see the water was very close to the gunnels on the side of his boat. And he, as he turned he felt his legs were trapped, and he looked down and at first thought that it was sand, but then saw that it was salt that was filling the boat. He looked around for the pestle and mortar, couldn't see it, it must have knocked onto the floor of the boat and he rummaged through the salt trying to find it but water started to lap over the sides of the boat making the salt even heavier and the boat slowly sank taking the pestle and mortar with it luckily the older brother could swim made it back to his island but he decided that he might change his ways and his younger brother he planned better for his finances having lost the pestle and mortar, he had to. But they became very close and very good friends. They never found the boat, they never found the pestle and mortar. In fact, they say that the pestle and mortar is still there to this day, churning out salt, which is why the sea is filled with salt. The end. Now, if you have been following Mara, the storyteller, you might have heard a very similar story today. Now, I, I had plans to tell two other different stories, but when I heard Mara telling that sto her story about why the sea is salt, salty, uh, I thought, i got to tell a similar story, because that would be so cool. It would be a lot of fun, because there were lots and lots and lots of salt mills in her story. So I'm thinking that maybe her story came from the Black Sea. I don't know. Maybe it came from the Black Sea, because that's really, really salty. And if you've got all those salt mills grinding out all that salt, that's probably why, right? Whereas this is Japan, and they only have this little tiny pestle and mortar to do the job. All right. Do you enjoy that story? All right. So if, that, if anyone's joined, go back and start at the beginning at some point, and you can watch it again. That's not a problem. Um, but I also want to remind folks that if you have kids with you, please send words or send pictures of drawings. Put them in the messages there. Okay? And what I'll do next Wednesday at 3 o'clock, and not 3.30 this time, because of technical issues, 
I'll put all of those little pictures and those words into a hat and I'll take the hat and I'll make up a story as we go along, which is something I do in schools. But it was something that Mara was doing. She had these kids send pictures in and she's making up stories from these pictures. So I'm going to do a similar thing, something that I already do in schools, but I'm going to pick these things out from a hat. Okay. Mara usually takes two or three pictures and uses those. And it's brilliant what she does. If you haven't seen Mara telling her stories, you should. No, this is not Ribena for my empire friends. But if you want to try and guess what it is, you can. Ribena is a blackcurrant cordial, which is the best drink in the world after tea. Non-alcoholic drink. So the next story I'm going to tell you is it's an old, old, old story. And it was told by a man who came from Ethiopia. Now this man, he was taken from his home, forcibly taken from his home, and he was enslaved in Greece. But he earned his freedom. He didn't buy it, he earned it by telling stories, which is absolutely phenomenal, so the story goes. And you might have heard of this man. His name was Aesop. Now when I first read this story, long long time ago when I was a little kid I never really much liked it that much I was kind of like eh, it's all right it's not great but then a number of years ago a book came out by a gentleman called David Pinsky and in this picture book it was about this big about this big in this picture book there were no words it was just pictures and when I looked through it I was the pictures were gorgeous and there were no words and I was like this this is I know this story I went back to the beginning and I started to look at the pictures and see in my mind use my imagination to see how this story was told and the voices of the characters started to come there's only two characters in the story came to me and I was like I love this story so much and I turned the pages and I got to the end and I knew that I wanted to tell this story. And ever since I read that book by Mr. Pinsky, if I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, I can't remember it that well, I'm awful with names, I started to tell it. Two characters, lion and a mouse. And this lion, this lion, he was the most arrogant, stuck up, snobbish lion ever. He wasn't British, he was just stuck up and snobbish. Right, he was he was like walking around with his nose in the air. If there was a great stench, a, a terrible smell underneath him. Yeah, I am the best lion in the world. I am Lord of the Jungle, King of the Beasts. Yes, my mane is so magnificent. Look at my claws. <sighs> I love my claws. I love my fur. My mane is delightful. My tail. I've got such a lovely tail. <laughs> Lord of the jungle, king of the beasts, I can do anything I want. I am the most powerful creature of all. That was the kind of person, creature, that he was. I mean, he didn't need any help for anything. He did it all by himself. Hunted, lived by himself. One of those. You know what I'm talking about. Everyone has somebody like that nearby, either in school or at work. You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, this lion had eaten this huge breakfast, filled himself up, and he was tired, and so he lay down and... <laughs> he went to sleep. Now, as he was sleeping, there was this mouse. Little tiny mouse, little cute mouse, little tiny feet, little tiny claws, running around, little tiny eyes. Now, th this mouse was a bit like me. This mouse didn't see very well. I've got glasses to help me see very well. This mouse didn't have any glasses, and this mouse was running around, squeaking around, looking for, for, for seeds to, to take back home to his family. He's filling, he's filling his cheeks up with, with seed for his family. And he's running around and running around, and he sees this big pile of sand, and he thinks, oh, maybe if I get on top of that big pile of sand, I can look around and see much further and find much better seeds than I have right here. And so... Wait, this... this isn't sand. This is fur! This is... this is lion fur! Uh-oh! And the mouse started to creep slowly down the lion's leg. Now the lion was fast asleep. And the mouse jumped off, but when the mouse jumped off, he twitched his whisker. The whisker of the lion, and the lion... 
What are you doing waking me up? I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. I, I, I ran up on top of you. I don't have very good eyesight. And I thought you were a big pile of sand, a big, beautiful, masculine, powerful pile of sand. And I just wanted to get some seed for my family. Oh, I got some seed for my home, but I want more. Please let me go. Why should I let you go? I should eat you up. No, please don't eat me up. Please don't eat me. Maybe I can help you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're going to, <laughs> you're going to help me, so you're so small and I'm so big and powerful, How can you possibly help me? But you know what? You gave me a marvellous laugh. You did, you did. And so I shall let you go. But if ever I do need help, when I roar and call you, you will come and find me. Or else I will come and find you and eat you. You're a very funny mouse. <laughs> and he uncurled one claw after the other until the mouse doink, jumped off and bye, and off he went. And the lion went back to sleep. Now, here's the thing. The other day, a few days later, the lion was walking around the jungle, and he's got his head up in the air, the smell under his nose. Oh, he's a marvellous creature, the best creature in the world, the most powerful beast in the jungle. And he wasn't looking where he was going. You know, it's kind of like kids these days. Do, 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 do. And he walked into a trap. This great, great rope net was on the ground, covered with leaves, and when he stepped in it, <laughs> whoa, up into the air he went. Whoa, what's, what's going on? What's, this is a trap, I'm in a trap, I'm in a trap, I can't get out. <laughs> he tried to chew on the, on the rope, but lion's teeth aren't meant to chew through ropes. It doesn't work very well. And he tried to scratch and tear with his claws, but the claws aren't meant to tear ropes. I'm stuck here. This is terrible. I'm, I'm stuck here swinging in this, 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 this trap, this net, and, and the warriors, the warriors, they're going to come along and they're going to poke me with their, their, their spears and their sticks, and it's most indignified to be poked at with a stick. I know. I don't want to be poked at with sticks or sharp things. It's, it's terrible. It hurts as well, and then they might take me away. Mouse. Mouse! Lion roared and roared for mouse. A mouse heard lion's roar and came scurrying along, following the sound of Lion, until he came into the area where he heard Lion roar. But he couldn't see Lion anywhere. Where, where, where are you, Lion? I, I can't see you. What, what, what's going on? Where, where are you? I, I can't... I'm up here. What, oh, what, what are you doing up there? Well, I'm just hanging up. A trap, of course. Let me out. Oh, OK. And Mouse squinted his eyes and saw that from this net there was this rope that went over a branch and it came all the way down until it was nailed into the ground with a great wooden stake. So Mouse ran over to the stake and he started to <coughs> chew on that rope because mouse teeth are designed for gnawing through things like rope. <coughs> Flying up into the air, and lion came falling down to the ground, poof, in a great pile of lion dust. Mouse went over and chewed through more of those ropes, and broke lion out of that net, broke him out of the trap. Lion looked at Mouse. You know, I, I never thought that someone so small as you could help someone as strong and as mighty as I, but you did. You saved my life, and for that, I thank you. You're, you're very welcome. A mouse and lion became the best of friends. In fact, sometimes you might see mice and lions playing in the savannas. And that's the story of Lion and Mouse, originally collected by Aesop, Ethiopian, long, long time ago. All right, as we head towards the end of this, I just want to say thank you for all of those who, are come, who came. Um, I apologize again for the technical issue that I actually did all of this a half an hour when I said I was at three o'clock, um, but it wasn't broadcasting, so I'm not sure what happened. I need to figure that out. Um, thank you for coming back to me at 3.30 and spending a half hour of your time here. I greatly appreciate it. Next Wednesday at three o'clock, not at 3.30 or 3.35, 
I will be back with more stories. And remember, if you want to join in, please do so. You can send me messages uh, with words or you can send me drawings. You can either send them to me through my Facebook or you can email me. Go to my website, simonbrooksstoryteller.com. Um, there's, there's a form that you fill in. It's a fancy email. That's really all it is. Just fill in the form and you can uh, send me some drawings or send me a, uh, a message and I'll, I'll send you... Um, an email back and you can attach the drawings we'll figure it out it's all new and I'm planning on doing this every single Wednesday uh, at three o'clock uh, American Eastern time and I hope you enjoyed everything and that uh, you stay healthy and well and happy adios my storyteller friends goodbye